Hey, Grace family, wherever you're joining us from today, you're part of our family, and it's great to be with you guys. I believe God's going to use this time to encourage you and to inspire you and to challenge you to live a life of faith like never before. Now, there are a lot of you right now feeling the pull to get back to the basics of faith. Maybe you walked away from God or you became complacent in recent years or, or maybe you never really even followed Christ before. Well, the whole reason for this series right now is to help us all go back to the words and the teachings of Jesus. To put aside any misconceptions, any agendas, any of our own blurry ideas about religion and just go straight to his life and his words. The real deal. Because we can build a life on the real deal. And so it's a series we're calling Jesus Never Said That. And we want to go straight to the source. And, and today I want to talk about a big one. You know, as Americans, we're, we're very individualistic. And there's a good side to that. We like our independence. We're, we're free spirits. It's one of the things that makes our country awesome. We're a little rebellious. We don't like to be told what to do. I mean, it takes us back to being penned in by the British and we got out of Dodge, you know. And so when, when somebody tells us what to do, we generally want to do the opposite. It's part of our DNA. In fact, here's a picture I put together when, when quarantine just began. You know, just, just tell us what we're not allowed to do and we're going to do that. And so I'm not endorsing this behavior. I'm observing, okay. There's a, there, there's a positive side to this individualism. It leads to innovation and competition, things that generally make us better. But, but, individualism has a dark side too. And the dark side is that it can easily drift into what I want to talk about today. It's a mentality that says, I'm in this thing for me. I'm in it to win it. I'm, I'm looking out for number one. Nobody else matters but me and mine. And it's interesting that this pandemic that we're going through right now can actually magnify this dark side. I heard a podcast with David Brooks. He's a New York Times columnist that has done a lot of research into plagues and pandemics through history. And, and the interviewer was, was hopeful that this pandemic was really going to bring our country together and make us stronger than ever before. That, that we're going to be the next version of the greatest generation and that we'll be brave and unified and honorable as a result of this shared experience and, and this common viral em enemy. And Brooks stopped him in his tracks and he said, well, I hate to burst your bubble. But that's typically not what happens in pandemics and plagues. Because, you see, in a war, the enemy's over there, and we can band together and we can fight the enemy. And in a natural disaster, for example, we can come to the rescue of the afflicted with, with no real risk to ourselves. But a pandemic, a pandemic is different because the longer it goes on, eventually the enemy starts to become my neighbor. Because he's the one who can get me sick. He's the one that I'm, I'm subliminally competing for, for, for food and, and survival. Brooks said that after the 1918 pandemic, a whole generation never talked about it again because they were embarrassed about who they had become. Friends abandoning friends. People failed to provide much-needed emergency aid. Nobody volunteered for community needs. Going in, people had these visions of themselves as, as these angels of mercy, but in the heat of battle, no one answered the call. And so pandemics tend to bring out the worst in us, the cutthroat version. We already saw just a little glimpse of what's possible with the hoarding of toilet paper and, and exponential gun sales. What's that all about? Well, we default to a, a basic place that says every man for himself. And if it comes down to you or me, well, sorry, it's me. Everyone for themselves. I just want to make sure you hear me loud and clear. Jesus never said that. He called us to something more admirable. He called us to something more transcendent, to rise above our selfishness. And so I, I want to turn with you to one of the most foundational teachings of Jesus. It's in Mark 12, 28 to 34, and it's known as the Great Commandment. So you can find your way there in your Bible or device. It'll also be on the screen as I read it. And as usual, there's a little bit more going on here than meets the eye. Listen to Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he'd answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. 
And so this is such a life-shaping passage. But before we dive fully into it, I want to deal with that last little line there. Because that last line tells us that there's more going on. So something that our modern ears don't hear. We hear love, 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 and what a sweet little passage. Love God and love each other, rainbows and cotton candy and fairy dust. And some of you who are Christians, you've heard this passage so many times. It's like, it's like living next to the train tracks. Anybody ever lived next to the train tracks? I had a friend who did, and I'd, I'd go over to his house, and I'd say, man, how can you stand all this noise with all those trains going by? And he said, I don't even hear the noise anymore. Your, your ears have become conditioned. That's what happens with some of you with this passage. But to the original hearers, they heard something that made them afraid. Did you see that in verse 34? They weren't even mad. They were too scared to be mad. They were shell-shocked. They were petrified. No one dared ask him any more questions. Well, what did he say? Well, let me begin with just a few musings about law and love and politics. All right, ready? First of all, you have to understand that this passage picks up in the middle of a heated debate. Jesus was debating a group called the Sadducees. They were kind of the liberals of the day. They believed a, a version of moral relativism and even naturalism. Naturalism, which would say that this life is all that there is. And so they don't believe in a resurrection of the dead. And so Jesus had just wrapped up an argument with the, the liberals about the resurrection, okay? When, when a conservative wanders over and thinks, oh good, here's a rabbi that agrees with the conservatives, the, the scribes and Pharisees. These guys believed in rules and laws and morals all day long. And so verse 28 says, This conservative scribe came up and he heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked Jesus, Which commandment is the most important of all? Now this was a common question of the day. The conservatives thought that the, the, the way to get to heaven was to obey all the commandments. The problem was is that they had counted up 613 of them in the Old Testament. You thought 10 was bad. And so it was common to approach a rabbi and to ask him which he thought were the most important, like which were at the top of the list because 613 was a little overwhelming. And so the scribe approaches Jesus and he says, I can see you're not a relativist like those dirty Sadducees over there. You know there's a moral code that must be followed to a T to earn God's favor. But, but help a scribe out here, okay? I'm drowning under the weight of it all. So which is most important? And Jesus does what he always does. It's why by the end nobody dared ask him any more questions. He subverts the very premise that this young scribe is basing his question on. And he basically says, you've missed the whole point of all 613 commandments. And in this way, you're no better than the Sadducees. They missed the point of the law too. And so have you. Because all along, it's been about love. And guess what? All along, it's been pointing to me. You've kept your rules and you've missed the heart of God. And so Jesus comes at both systems, the conservatives and the liberals, and he says, your systems are wrong. It's all about love for me and love for others, and everything else is rubbish. That's why when people are, are, are talking now, you, you know, like, we won't get through this unless Trump is president again, or we won't get through this unless Biden becomes president. We won't get through this unless the whole country gets back to work. We won't get through this unless the whole country stays in quarantine. Jesus crashes into the room like the Kool-Aid man, and he says, you've got the wrong two options. You, you're all placing your hope in the wrong thing. If you're a Christian, you need to operate in the laws of love. And guess what? Neither of your little political systems are going to quite capture it. And all the laws don't go away. The commandments are valid. But when a commandment says something like, thou shall not commit adultery, Jesus is saying, well, what it's really saying is, love your spouse. And thou shalt not lie means love others enough to live authentically. And don't steal means to live a radically generous life. It's all about love, you see. Now that being said, let me speak to the other extreme for a minute. So, so some of you hear me say that and you're like, see, I told you we should be, you know, we, we, we should be, we shouldn't be following that closed-minded Bible. Instead, we should just be doing the loving thing in the moment. Here's the problem with that. We're not the most trustworthy deciders of what's most loving. So when a person says, you know, just don't obey God's law, just do the loving thing, I would say every single time you disobey God, every single time you lie, every time you steal, every time you commit adultery, every time you break any of God's laws, what you're really saying is, I think I know what is actually more beneficial, more loving to do, and better than God. And guys, you don't. You can't. And so Jesus comes, and he's wrecking their systems. He's saying, I don't fit into any of your molds. My way is a different way. 
The law of love, you see, wrecks all of our political constructs because it's that what, what those constructs say is everyone for themselves. And so they hear this and they don't dare ask him any more questions. I love that. But let me ask you this. Do you have any neatly constructed systems that Jesus needs to step in and wreck? How about this one? Everyone for themselves. Let's take it a little closer to home. When you hear a crash in the living room and you rush in where your kids are playing and the finger pointing begins. What's that? Everyone for themselves. Or something goes wrong at work and it's, you know, cover your, your butt time and everyone for themselves. Or your marriage is crumbling and you think if my spouse would just do this or that and this and this. It's everyone for themselves. But Jesus comes in and he wrecks our systems. Jesus didn't say that. Do you know what he did say? He said, it's we over me. This is the way of Jesus. This is the way of the gospel, the way of the cross. And so I want to walk through the great commandment with you in Mark 12 and explore four decisions of a we over me life. And so let's go back to verse 29. Remember, Jesus is being asked what's the most important commandment, and he says this. He says, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And so here's the first decision I want you to see of a we over me life. It's I will nurture a daily, whole person allegiance to God. It begins and ends here, guys. This is the most important. Jesus says, love God with every part of you. And I want you to see how pervasive this relationship with God is supposed to be. Jesus is quoting here from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which is known as the Shema. Every observant Jew would recite the Shema every morning and every evening. Here was the rest of it. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. Do you get what God is saying here? Watch this. In your house and walking by the way means your private life and your public life. When you lie down and when you rise, that's your entire waking life. That's wall to wall. On your hands and in between your eyes means your actions and your thoughts. Are you starting to see the comprehensiveness of this? There can be no fragmentation of your faith. To write the laws on the doorposts of your home and to teach them to your children means to apply them to your family and to write them on the gates of your city means to apply them to the economic and the political and the civic life of the whole society. This is what the Shema is saying. If you love God with all your heart, then you will love God with all your life. When he says these things should be on your heart, he's not saying that they're private. He's saying that God is in the position of command and control of every facet of your life. Public, private, inner, outer, mind, body. You should be constantly asking the question as you go through your day. How must my relationship with God affect this? How should I think here? How should I act here? How should I live here? How should I relate here? How should I speak here? Everything. It's a daily, whole person allegiance. You see, the way of Jesus has to affect our real lives, our whole lives, heart, soul, mind, strength. It leaves nothing out. 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. We have a game like this. I heard Francis Chan liken it to a divine follow the leader. Remember follow the leader? Kids don't play this anymore because there's no app for it. But it was a good one. Amen, children of the 70s and 80s. It's a good one. Not Simon says, let's not go crazy. It's just follow the leader. And here's what would happen. The leader would flap her wings and everyone else would flap their wings. Remember this? The leader would take long steps and everyone else would take long steps. The followers would just do what the leader showed them to do. This is the Christian life. And yet somehow Christians have twisted the game around. Follow Jesus has become different than follow the leader because we figured out that instead of doing actual things, we can just do things in our heart. So I'm flapping my wings in my heart, right? In the game, if the leader says, pat your head, that's just what you do. No questions asked. But follow Jesus is a totally different game somehow. If Jesus said it, instead of doing it, maybe you just have to memorize it. Like, he says, go make disciples or love your enemies. Whew, I got that memorized. It's filed away. Now I don't have to actually do it. It's like, where do we get this idea? 
Love the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Apply this in your home and on your streets and on your doorposts and city gates, in your head and with your hands. Jesus is saying, do this. And I don't know about you, but when I tell my kids to do something, like when I say, hey, Aiden, you know, make sure you put your laundry away. She doesn't come back two hours later and say, Dad, I memorized what you said. Like, memorized what? What you said. Listen, I'll recite it for you. Aiden, your clothes are folded. Now go put them away. Did I get it word perfect? Wait, what, Aiden? I just wanted you to do it. Or she doesn't say, listen, Dad, I figured out how to say put your laundry away in the Greek now. Yeah, I did a whole word study on it. I compared it to other times you mentioned clothes. Or like I did a a Zoom call, Dad, with with a bunch of my friends, and we decided to start a five-week life group about what it could look like if we all put our laundry away. You understand, I'm not knocking, memorizing the Bible or doing life groups. What I'm pointing out here is that Jesus is saying, "I, I didn't give you commands to simply memorize them or talk about them or debate them. I gave you my commands to actually do them. Love God with everything you are, with your whole life, your whole self. And so what would it look like for you to love God more today than you did yesterday? To love God more at 2 o'clock than you did at 1 o'clock? Jesus is saying that the first step toward an we over me kind of life is to nurture a daily allegiance to the God of the Bible. To follow him. You need him because you can't muster up, I promise, you can't muster up the selflessness to do it on your own. It can't come from you. You won't be able to cut it. You need outside help. Because look at what Jesus says next. He said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. I like to visualize these two commands in the shape of a cross. The vertical, the post is the love between God and us. It's that vertical love. Uh, the, the loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the horizontal cross beam is the love that connects us with other people. Love your neighbor as yourself. And at the center of the cross, is this, uh, this love is Christ. It's only by his help and through his sacrifice that we can live out these expressions of love. So what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Because let's be honest, most of us have a tendency to love ourselves and not really our neighbors. And Jesus understands that love for self is, is, is a kind of given. He's not commanding it here. He's assuming it. All of us have a powerful instinct of self preservation and self fulfillment. We all want to be happy. We all want to live with satisfaction. We want food for ourselves. We want a place to live for ourselves. We want protection from violence for ourselves, a meaningful activity to fill our days. We want friends to like us. We want our life to count in some way. We want toilet paper, right? This is self-love. Self-love is the deep longing to diminish pain and increase joy. That's what Jesus starts with when he says, as yourself. But here's the radical part. He says, as you love yourself, so love your neighbor. This will keep your self-love properly regulated. It will protect you from moving into pride or narcissism. Now, this is very threatening and almost overwhelming for some because we feel immediately that if we take Jesus seriously, we will not just have to love others as we love ourselves. We will have to love them instead of loving ourselves. But think of it as loving your neighbors in the same way you love yourself. In the same way you long to be accepted, seek for your neighbor to be accepted. In the same way you long to be fulfilled, help your neighbor to be fulfilled. In the same way that you long to be safe, seek for your neighbor to be safe. The shocking thing is that Jesus seems to put this love for neighbor in the same category as our love for God on the importance scale. In fact, John says it more explicitly in 1 John 4.19. He says, we love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And so with this in mind, I want us to think through a few more decisions of a we over me life. The second one is this. It's a decision that just says, I will reach out to my actual neighbors. These are the people who live right around you. A couple years ago, we did this little block map exercise where we challenge you to fill out the names of the people who live in the houses, the eight houses closest to you. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but people are, right now, they're out walking more than ever before since the lockdown. And so, so the idea here is that in order to love our neighbors, we must first actually know our neighbors. Dave Runyon wrote this book, The Art of Neighboring, and he said in a, a recent interview that I did with him that the key is to, to push through that awkward moment, the, the awkward moment many of us face that says, hey, I know that we've lived next to each other for like 10 years, but what's your name again? Okay. 
because the good stuff is on the other side of that awkward moment. And I've heard so many stories of neighbors these days exchanging information with each other. Like, if you need anything, call me. We, my family, had a distancing get-together with our neighbors, and we watched the, the International Space Station fly overhead. I heard of one person who had gone around and kind of collected up contact information, and then he got almost 30 neighbors together who are participating in regular Zoom calls, and they're just talking about life, how everyone met their spouse, the names and interests of their kids, what brought them to the area, just stuff they never knew about each other before. And here's the deal. As you become a coordinator of efforts like these in your neighborhood, you might see your status change from loving your neighbors to becoming the pastor of your neighborhood or your apartment complex or your condo or whatever is your situation. I think Jesus knew something that we often forget. I think he knew that this wasn't just a nice idea, but this, this was his strategy to reach the world. He knew that the most effective way for the good news to spread was not through church services or seminars, but instead when ordinary people like you and me show love to the actual neighbors, the people that we brush up against every day, and we leave them scratching their heads about the love that we show. It doesn't make sense. It's a good plan, and we all have a part to play. Here's the third decision. It just says, I will be proactive in caring for people in my path. I get this wording from another passage over in Luke 10 when Jesus is talking about love for neighbor and someone asks him a clarifying question. He asks, who is my neighbor? I think what he's asking is, where does this whole neighboring thing stop? Like the dude next door and then call it quits? Is that all right? And Jesus responds by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. And if I were to summarize Jesus' answer to this question, who is my neighbor, I think here's what he said. Anyone in your path. You see, it seems that God brings people in, into and out of our lives at different times. And we're supposed to care for them while they're in our lives. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite passed by this struggling man on the side of the road. But the Samaritan stopped and showed him care in some profound ways. Dr. Martin Luther King had some, some great insight on this story. He said, Christians have to change the question. The priest and the Levite who ignored the man's needs as they passed by, they asked the question, if I do stop to help this man, what will happen to me? The good Samaritan reversed it. He asked the ultimate we over me question. He asked, if I don't stop and help this man, what will happen to him? This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of neighboring, to love others as you love yourself, to care for others as you would want to be cared for yourself, to think, what if that was me lying on the side of the road in my time of need? How would I want someone to treat me? But there's something that regularly gets in the way of showing love to people in our path, and it's our tendency to generalize. I think this is one of the biggest enemies to caring for people. It's what makes us not even think twice about caring for them. It's when we say all blank people are blank. It's a generalization. It's an easy way to justify ourselves in not caring for them. And so we say all rich people are greedy. All fat people are slobs. All young people are lazy. All old people are grumpy. All black people are angry. All white people are privileged. All pastors are handsome. You know, whatever it is, we all have our cross to bear. Listen, I'm, a, I'm serious. I'm serious. As soon as we can create a category and stick someone in it, we can justify why we don't need to love them. How about this current one? All people who want the quarantine to be over care about money more than lives, or all people who want to stay in quarantine are living in fear, not faith. Guys, we can all have opinions about this, but when we create a category and we stick someone in it, pretty soon we can hate them. We, we got to get away from this. What does Jesus say? The story of the Good Samaritan, who is my neighbor, is a story of love across categories. The Samaritan shouldn't have cared for the Jew and the Jew shouldn't have let the Samaritan care for him and instead love one the day. Be proactive in caring for the people in your path. Here's the last decision I want you to see. The most radical expression of a we over me life is this. I will choose to love instead of cancel my enemy. You see, Jesus, as he's usually doing, he's upping the ante on just loving your neighbor. I want you to listen to this from Matthew 5. 43 and 44. He says, you've heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Guys, we live in a cancel culture. 
This is happening a lot these days. So, so the political left, it says if someone says that, you know, some, says something that doesn't fit their modern narrative, that person gets canceled. And so we'll protest violently on campus to make sure that person that we don't agree with can't speak. Or if a person's posting something offensive 10 years ago on Twitter, we're going to make sure that they can't host the Oscars. They're canceled. Last week, a legitimate publicly traded biotech company was suspended from Twitter because they'd been doing research on a procedure that the president mentioned in his press conference. They got canceled. So if you align with someone I don't agree with, you're canceled. And listen, before any conservative religious people start feeling good about themselves, I think you all invented the cancel culture. And I just don't like it because it's coming full circle. But when I was a kid, I remember hearing that Amy Grant, remember her? She was a Christian musician. Well, she got a divorce, and Christians were losing their minds. They were boycotting her concerts. Radio stations that played her music were being, they wanted her canceled. And it was the first time I ever heard the phrase, Christians are the only army that shoots their own wounded. And I've seen it ever since on the right. And so when we're tempted, left, right, center, wherever you are, when we're tempted to cancel people that we hate and censor people that we disagree with or to lash out at our opponents, Jesus steps in and he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know why it's so important, why we push back against the temptation to just go, every man for himself, I'm in it for me alone. Do you know why? Because this is what separates us from the rest of the world. This is what gains credibility among the skeptics and the mockers and has a chance to penetrate their hearts. It's our love. That's our calling card, our distinguishing mark. John 13, 35, Jesus says, by this all people will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. And some of you are thinking, I just don't know if I can do it. I'm not sure I have it in me. That's right. None of us can do it on our own. We need Christ's help. We need the cross. We need the Holy Spirit. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, this life giving and receiving of radical love won't be possible for you. It comes back to that very first thing we talked about, your surrender to God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And here's what I know for sure. God wants to have a relationship with you. In fact, he came to earth and he lived and he died on a cross and he conquered death itself to prove his love for you. And you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be cleaned up to come to him. In fact, you just have to admit that you're a sinner to own up to your own junk to repent and turn around. You see, becoming a Christian isn't about doing all the right things or going to church. It certainly has nothing to do with politics. Jesus offers a whole different way. It just means inviting Jesus to lead your life and surrendering your will to him. My question is this. Is Jesus living in your life right now? Some of you may say, well, I'm not sure. Let me ask you this. If somebody moved into your house during quarantine, do you think you would know it? Like you'd start seeing some evidence, right? Some extra clothes laying around, dishes out of place. Like you will know. And so if Jesus is living inside of you, you will know. There's going to be obvious evidence. And listen, if you don't know, he's probably not. So I want you to be sure. I want to urge you to take this step today if that's you. In just a moment, I want you to text the word GRACE NEXT to 94090. When you receive a text back, you're just going to choose the number one. It just says, I want to follow Jesus. And listen. There are others of you who have been Christians for a while, but you need to step up in this whole area of loving others. In fact, just knowing that Jesus put loving your neighbor at this level of importance, it's a huge wake-up call for you. We have so many great opportunities right now to help you to love and care for others. Very simple. Text that same word, grace next to that same number, 94090, and when you receive a text back, just choose option two, and you'll be directed to those great opportunities. I want you to watch now this incredible spoken word called How to Neighbor. And I would love for a whole army of you as this song is playing to respond to God's spirit today and take one of those steps. Check out this song. God bless you guys.